The Revolution Partnership was really a dream partnership for us. This, this panel is going to be called Beyond the Tweet. So it's working with celebrities and working with the entertainment industry in a way that is, it's always exciting if you have somebody tweet out, you know, on your social media. But there's really such opportunity to build deeper partnerships and share issues across a larger space. Uh, and Revolution was a show that was just a home run for us. It's a show that had a world with no energy. And the Secretary General, one of his priorities is letting people know that there's actually a world without energy. So it's a really unique opportunity for us to take a deep dive with, uh, the, as you saw from the panelists, um, and Carlos here from the UN. Uh, we've got Sherry here from World Wildlife Fund. We've got Mike from One, and we've got Carolyn from Farm Aid. So um, th the work that I do day to day, I'm Danny Zapatozny from the UN Foundation. I work closely with the UN Creative Community Outreach Initiative, and just really excited to be here talking and then continuing the conversation about how can entertainment affect cost. What can we do in a deeper way, going beyond the tweet, to really partner with the entertainment industry as storytellers? Uh, that does involve talent a lot of times. All of our participants are working closely with some of the household names, but the partnerships that are having an impact uh, sometimes are coming from unexpected voices. So I'd love for you all, I'm gonna start off with Mike actually from One, to give us a top line of, you know, what does one doing? But then we're going to talk a little bit more specifically about your Agitate project and sure. some of the folks other than Bono uh, that you're, <laughs> you're working with. Sure. Um, thank you. Hi, guys. Uh, my name is Mike Drashkovich. I'm a, a marketing manager at One. Uh, One is a global uh, grassroots and campaigns advocacy organization. Uh, we're based in Washington, D.C., but we have offices around the world. And what we do is we use the power of people's voice to uh, change policy as it relates to development programs and policy. So um, we're a big believer that uh, uh, we can, as a, a group, hold people accountable for their political promises and, um, and deliver some really fantastic development programs. So tell us about Agitate. Sure. It's a new, and, and how you're reaching out to millennials in a different way. Sure. So um, this past summer we launched um, a program called Agitate, and it's a global music project in which we asked uh, artists to cover iconic protest songs as a way to raise awareness and garner support around our G G8 transparency policy ask. So it got a little wonky, but it was a perfect entry point into the campaign because we, um, we went out to some of the world's biggest acts and also uh, YouTube stars and up-and-coming acts and garage bands and said, hey, Hey, here's some protest songs we'd love for you guys to cover. Um, the idea came about because we recognized that one, you know, we're not in the music business, we're in the advocacy business, so we really believe in the power of voice, like I said, to affect change. We also recognize that music is in our DNA. So we, we thought, how do we combine these two things? And we partnered with Spotify and YouTube to build a project or this digital experience at the nexus of music, social good, and tech um, that enabled these artists to all uh, 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 cover these iconic protest songs. So um, we learned it's a great way, you know, or, I say the biggest lesson learned um, from the project was, you know, aligning your brand in such a way that you act as like a conduit for what these artists are already doing. And they can be any type of digital influencer, so chefs or uh, uh, you name it, but uh, in this case, it was easy for these artists to participate, and it is, you know, forming a very genuine relationship with them. How does it feel different working with a YouTube artist? So for, for an old person like me, it's always interesting when you talk to teens and you talk to millennials, that's what they're watching, that's their content. How is that a different, you know, there's much more structure yeah. to working with somebody who has an agent and a manager and... Well, I think um, it actually reminds me, one of, the, one of my favorite components of the Agitate project was a YouTube project we ran called um, the Come Together Project. And we were really interested in connecting with uh, this new generation of you know, activists who are watching a lot of their content on YouTube. And so um, we went out with at first a competition project where we wanted to pit you know, these artists on YouTube against each other and whoever got the most votes on their video would get a spot on our ultimate Agitate album on Spotify alongside the likes of U2 and Bruce Springsteen, Macklemore and others. Uh, what we learned through feedback and talking with these managers is actually they get asked to do this often and instead could we make it more collaborative? So we switched the project, made it about supporting each other. So anyone who got a thousand votes on their video or likes on their video could be included. And so we had actually had artists who, once they achieved the a thousand you know, vote mark, started supporting other artists. So it was a real cool celebration of community that I think 
got their fans excited, exposed uh, new artists to their fans. So it was, it was a really fun approach. And I think it worked well and resonated with millennials. That's really cool. That, that makes me think, Carolyn, of our conversation. Carolyn's with Farm Aid. If you could open up, just give us a little bit of background on your work. But it's a very different uh, connection to artists because artists founded your organization. So it's a different rapport. But I think it really impacts the DNA of what you do. Um, and so the, the collaboration piece and the inspiration piece, how does, how does that work for you? Well, it, it is really different because Farm Aid was started by Willie Nelson, Neil Young, John Mellencamp, and then Dave Matthews joined. Some Mark very there. small unknown people. <laughs> but it was started out of, a, out of um, their seeing and knowing and using their, the best that they had, which is that they're singers, they're artists, and they said, I've got to do something about the fact that family farmers are being forced off the land. And this was in 1985, which was a very different climate than it is today in terms of people's understanding of the importance of where our food comes from. There's a lot that's changed since then. But they, they said, they, they did from their heart what they know how to do best, which is sing. And uh, it brought together, I think, 70 artists in just a few weeks, came together for a rather large show <laughs> in, uh, in, in Illinois. But it's been going ever since, and none of those artists thought that this was going to take this long. They're used to things happening a little faster, but as, um, as we stuck with it and they saw what was happening um, and what a deep problem this is and how it represents a real societal problem and a a problem that family farmers are not seen and heard. Um, they've stayed committed to this um, boldly, and I call them junkyard dogs. You know, they do not give up. They are in it, and they're constantly relating to us. We relate to them. They relate to farmers. The DNA, I think, of Farm Aid is the DNA of, of Willie primarily, but also the other four, and that is he's a great listener. And so uh, Willie had listened to farmers for quite a while uh, at truck stops and wherever at his concerts. He'll talk to people after his concerts and he knew that there was something really wrong with this country, with the fabric of this country, when our family farmers were forced off the land. So now it has come to mean much more as we see industrial agriculture taking over, um, polluting the water, the land with chemicals. And uh, it's become a far bigger um, family because we uh, relate to eaters. We put farmers together with eaters and we create an event once a year where people really come together. There's a huge event where we have 50 exhibitors in a homegrown village all day long during the concert um, with interactive exhibits. So I won't go on, but anyway. Well, and it's the longest yeah. running benefit concert. I believe it is. Domestically. I believe it is. How do you keep the excitement going every year? How do you, you know, you said the artists that you, they're always coming back to you with new ideas and yeah. how do you keep their engagement level up or, or do you have to? <laughs> it's, it's them keeping us. I mean, it really is completely a handshake. It's not keeping their interest up. They are very interested and they're involved. They, they get involved in aspects of campaigns going on, GMO campaigns, um, uh, ethanol campaigns, and they've been very involved. So it's really, it's a back and forth between the artists and us. It's, um, you know, the artist is someone that brings everybody in and we're a big funnel. We, we welcome everybody. Farm Aid is a place that welcomes people to come in where they're at and then we have something for them. And I think that hits on a big thing, though. You know, people, when in moving beyond the tweet, a lot of it is you have to find somebody who this is what they care about. And so you're not, if you're forcing things on them and it's not really a partnership, it never really works. It doesn't go deeper. Um, so Sherry, at World Wildlife Fund, tell us a little bit about what you do. And you've worked with, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio on your board and all, all sorts of folks. But we were talking about some interesting, unexpected voices and, and deeper moments that you've had. Yeah. So for those of you that don't know, the World Wildlife Fund works around the world to protect um, endangered species and their habitats, uh, not just for the good of the animals, but also for the good of people, because we utilize natural resources just as the animals utilize those areas that they need to survive. So it's a very holistic approach to um, protecting endangered species. And is, am, I, am I too close? Yeah. Is that better or worse? Is that good? That's better, right? Can you hear me? Okay. So yeah, so we've actually um, worked with recently a few unexpected voices, as you put it. Um, one of them being um, Billy Bush, who is the entertainment anchor and correspondent for Access Hollywood. 
We had some, um, through some personal relationships at WWF and also the National Geographic Wild Channel, um, we were able to approach Billy about going to Nepal on a trip with World Wildlife Fund to track and collar a rhino, which is a highly endangered species in that area. And um, he was actually extremely intrigued about the possibility, and uh, we began planning a trip. Oh, gosh. That, that's good. Thank you. Is that better? Okay. Now we're good, right? Is that better? Awesome. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. So, um, so we actually began planning the trip, and he began teasing it out on Access Hollywood. So a really different audience for World Wildlife Fund, as you can imagine. Um, so we took him to Nepal. We tracked down that rhino. Um, Billy actually helped us collar it, take the temperature, the measurement of the rhino. We had the National Geographic wild film crew with us the whole time. Um, it was tremendously branded because WWF was the on-the-ground science team that took the film crew and Billy into that area, which is a very remote access, hard to get to. Um, so, you know, we had everybody branded in the tees and the, and the gear, but also um, the trucks that were getting to these remote locations. So that piece was a really nice embedded branded piece that was authentic and not really forced, um, which was kind of a nice um, addition to um, the more obvious things. Um, Billy actually produced a PSA for us. His team at Access Hollywood did it. Um, it premiered on Access Hollywood, and it was talking about the plight of rhinos. He teased the documentary before its premiere in October, the whole week before, with his co-hosts. Um, we had an event in DC uh, for the premiere of the documentary, where he flew from LA and attended the event. Um, it was also attended by sort of the glitterati of DC. Um, the ambassador of Nepal to the United States came. Um, the CEO of World Wildlife, of course, was there, along with executives from National Geographic Channel. Um, so it was, it was a really high profile event. We had a lot of local press. We took advantage of that and did a satellite media tour at that time, both television and radio. Uh, and because of the connection with Access Hollywood, which is an NBC show, um, we were able to leverage the NBC connection and Billy went on the Today Show and talked about the documentary. So it was a fully integrated, you know, very well thought out communications plan ar around this sort of a germ of an idea is take a celebrity to the field and show them what you can do. But it was more than that. It was like, how do we maximize this opportunity and how do we reach a different audience with this rather unexpected um, host for the documentary? And um, at the end, he really says it changed his life. He's very engaged. We're still talking to him about other projects. Um, and it actually also had an added benefit of we are working more closely than ever, ever with uh, National Geographic and not just the Wild Channel, but across all their divisions. Um, in fact, we're partnering with them on an IMAX release from their entertainment division that's um, coming out in May. So, yeah. And shout out to NBC for doing Revolution. You might think that you wouldn't need to have a megaphone at the United Nations. You have the mothership of global issues. You have the platform. Why would you work with the entertainment industry? So, Carlos, you're you know in charge of the Messenger of Peace program, and also we're responsible for the Revolution Partnership. Talk to us about how the UN values that and, and what that does for the UN. Okay. So yes, um, I work at the UN. My name's Carlos Islam. So, like as Trey says, it's a prerequisite to have. a a funny name, a strange name, um, but um, yeah. So the U the UN you know works is well. It's an intergovernmental organisation. So 193 governments all belong to the UN. They give us our mandate. Um, I work in a communications arm of the UN, so our, you know we have to um, promote the the UN, the issues it works on, and and not and be told to educate the public on what the UN is and what it does. Um, so you know when they're when every year in September, you know heads of state and government they come to New York, they fly in, the world's press are there, um, and if you watch CNN International or BBC, you know you'll you'll see um, Barack Obama or Gaddafi in his, at his time um, speaking at the UN. Um, or even when uh, you know when um, there's a natural disaster like the typhoon in the Philippines recently, um, the world's press go there. But then, 
you know, unless you're watching, you know, the news, which apparently the vast majority of countries, in, like in the Western world, especially the UK where I come from and, and the States, you, you don't really know or see what's going on. And when the, the news subsides, um, the cameras disappear, then the UN isn't really there and in the forefront. Except for when someone like Angelina Jolie, who's a goodwill ambassador for the refugee agency, goes to later to visit a refugee camp in, uh, for Syrian refugees flooding over the, um, the borders um, into Lebanon, for example. Then you know, the cameras go back because it's Angelina Jolie going to see the refugees, going to talk to them, find out what uh, the situation is on the ground. So that's, I mean, that's just one example of why it's important to, for us to have um, you know, high-profile celebrities um, you know, talking on our behalf and working on our behalf and, and re you know, Revolution is a very good example. The clip you saw earlier on in the refugee camp, that, that's very real. You know, people who have been you know, forced to leave their homes and everything behind into a, a camp where there's thousands of people, there's no food, there's, you know, the, well, there's the UN and NGOs are providing food, shelter, education for kids and water, but it's, it's hard to come by. And um, so that, that clip that you saw where people are fighting to get to the food when it arrives is, is very real. And uh, so working with NBC and Revolution to, you know, when an episode like that comes out, we blog about it. Our numbers spike on our UN blog. We don't normally, you know, be talking about human rights investigators, you know, who, who go to Guinea, uh, Guinea Conakry to, because thousands of women were killed and raped. And we blog about that, we get a few hundred, but if we blog about something that's been on TV, we get thousands of people sharing, sharing the blog. So it makes a difference to us. Without the public knowing and understanding what the UN does, you know, then there's no support for their governments who you know, make up the UN and give us, uh, you know, give us our mandates to do, to do what we do. Great, Carlos, thank you. I think we're going to wrap it up and hand it back to JR, but thank you all for being here today and for the great work that you're doing. So much. We'll go ahead and leave you guys up there because I think we may have a question from the audience. Okay. But So as the audience maybe thinks of a question, I'd like to make a statement and then actually have you all respond. And Mike, I want you to respond first, if that's okay. Uh, so maybe one or two of you respond. So one of the things that we talk a lot about at Frequency is that people are more than consumers. It actually really pisses us off when people are like, you know what, what we want to really do is mobilize consumers. I'm like, so you want to motivate the part of me that buys stuff? Or you want to motivate me, like as a human being, somebody who cares about things? And certainly when I buy things, it's part of who I am. So we would suggest that people are more than consumers. And they're activists and they're storytellers. So as you think about creating movements of change, why is that such an important thing uh, for not just you to understand, but for us to understand, and maybe even big brands to understand? Mike? Um, I think it's all about empathy in this case, and as a brand demonstrating that you have that quality. It's about showing that you're not just about moms or college students, but you're about entrepreneurs and business people and uh, chefs. So. The, um, the more, I mean, you know, uh, to resonate with the most people, and uh, there's that business uh, saying that you know, your market's your destiny. It's really about putting on that, that, that face, you know, um, uh, having, having as many kind of programs that appeal to different constituencies as possible. That's great. Anybody else want to respond to that? I'll just quickly respond. I mean, Farm Aid, when it's, it has always been built on grassroots activism. We have supported hundreds of groups around this country that you would probably not know exist, that exist all over farm country. There's fantastic people doing fantastic work to change things. So that's at the very core of Farm Aid is supporting that. And then now, doing a lot more work to connect um, farmers and eaters, not consumers. Oh, We're nice. looking to a post-consumer yeah. society. That's good.